Hello, today's video is part of a series of interviews I'm doing to help publicize the 2022 conference of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. The conference is known as SICON, and it'll take place in Las Vegas from October 20th to the 23rd. Kenny Biddle is one of the speakers scheduled for SICON this year, and I'm happy to be able to talk with him now. Welcome, Kenny. Hey, buddy. It's good Bernie, to be here. I, I am so glad to have you. Uh, for any viewers who don't know who you are, let me fill them in. Uh, Kenny's bio on the Psycon website, in part, reads as follows. Kenny Biddle has been investigating and solving mysteries for over two decades. Wow. His inv investigations have entailed everything from debunking ghosts, hunting gadgets, and famous haunted houses, to exposing psychics and recreating photographic evidence, scare quotes, of an afterlife. He hosts co-hosts two live stream shows each week, providing an informed, skeptical approach to paranormal topics. He also writes an online column, A Closer Look for Skeptical Inquire, and produces the vlog series, Ghosts in the Machine, detailing his various investigations. Biddle frequently attends paranormal-themed events, and you have one coming up, to yes. bring skepticism and critical thinking where it is much needed. Conspicuously left out of there is Kenny Biddle's a freaking CSI fellow. How did, what? I got that. Has that I need to update yet, that. Yeah, I, I need to, yeah, I have to have them update that. They, they also didn't have it for Wiseman, so don't feel bad. Okay. And he's been for many years, I think. Uh, so Kenny was elected a fellow in 2020, and I first interviewed him on the heels of that announcement in an article titled, Meet CSI's Newest Fellow, Kenny Biddle. And you were showing a plaque there? Yes, that's my plaque right there. There you go. Yeah. It's very proud of it. So welcome, Kenny. The tables are turned. You've had oh. me in your hot seat twice as a guest on yes. your Skeptical Help Bar. Now I get to ask all the questions. Oh, <laughs> let's see what happens. <laughs> so first, let's talk about why you ain't afraid of no ghosts. <laughs> so in your Skeptical talk, which is the West Coast uh, Skeptical Conference, it was all virtual this year. Yes. It was just, just last weekend. You told a fascinating story of your transition from true believer to skeptical paranormal investigator. Uh, can you give us the highlights of that journey into the light of reason? Ooh, the highlights. So basically, <clears throat> for for growing up, I was raised Catholic. And I mean, it, that, that was bad enough because uh, it just set me up to believe anything and everything. And luckily, it did, didn't did, just... Let me stop you there. I always ask this for Catholic. Did you actually ever believe that the host turned into the body and the wine turned into the blood. I was Literally. never sure. I always wanted, like, that. that's a good question because I, I remember first communion, your first holy communion. That's where you, you go through this, this rite of passage and you get it for the first time. And I was freaked out because I was like, I don't know. Does this really turn into, like, skin? Like, Are you going to be a cannibal? Yeah, what's going on? And and are, am I going to get wine? Am I allowed to? Am I going to get in trouble for this? Because I was only a little kid, you know. And the first time I did, and and I remember actually uh, the the priest held it up and he went to put the wafer on my tongue, and I backed off because I didn't want him touching me. <laughs> it was weird. Probably like, wise. You know, most people don't put their fingers like at your mouth, so I was like. Uh, no. And I, the nun actually uh, bumped me on the back of the head, you know, like, do it, get it done. It's like, okay. So I, I, I was never sure if it actually changed, but the idea of it just, I didn't want to find out, but I did want to find out. Okay. I'm sorry for the digression. Go ahead. It's okay. It's all right. So you're a Catholic. <laughs> yes. Uh, Catholic and raised to believe that there was an afterlife, there was a God, uh, people died, they went to heaven, hell, this and that. And that, act, that that led me into believing in ghosts and all the other kinds of weird things out there, monsters and Bigfoot, UFOs, aliens. It just opens you up to believing without evidence because that's basically what religion is. It's, it's faith. It's believing without evidence. And mostly because I was raised that way. I was told, you believe or else. Um, yeah. So you get that Catholic guilt trip. Oh, wow. Um, so I, I guess the further along I had uh, experiences, uh, when I go, uh, I went to a ghost hunting team, I, I joined a ghost hunting team, and I had a particular experience in Gettysburg that kind of changed my mind about things. 
um, that about it wasn't. How old, how old were you about? Uh, probably in my late, well, yeah, late 20s. So late 20s, early 30s, I think late 20s um, when, it, when this happened. And it really transitioned to me. It really started the, the wheels turning. The wheels that really didn't turn before because I was, I was horrible in school. I, I was the class clown. I was horrible. I didn't care about grades. I wanted to just get out of school. And that has since switched. I love learning. I, I read everything I can. I learn as much as possible. So I love that. Um, but the, the particular uh, particulars of the experience, I mean, I, I go into it in that talk and I don't want to reveal them too, too uh, yet because I know that's uh, that was for the conference. But basically it was somebody mistook me as a ghost and there was there, were you like wearing a sheet i was not were wearing pranking, any pranking somebody what, what do you mean no i was in typical ghost hunting garb black uh black shorts black pants um black shirt and everything dark because that's what ghost hunters do they they wear dark stuff and then they turn out the lights um wherever they go and they blend in so, so i didn't even know that i picture ghost hunting garb as the outfits from ghostbusters like white. <laughs> but then I'm thinking white. That's why they thought you were a ghost. No, no, nothing unusual. But I was mistaken as a ghost. And from there, it really started the wheels turning. And I started really thinking about like why, why they mistook this, why, why they made this mistake, even though I tried to tell them uh, because I met with the people that claimed I was a ghost and tried to convince them no it was me and trading details and they still would oh so this was an instance believe. where you were giving them facts you absolutely yes. knew because it was you and they would rather believe their original version of the reality yes. it was my first taste of the uphill battle that we fight daily uh, that was my first big taste of that and uh from there i got more into photography because I was starting to do more talks about ghost photos. And before I was going to do them at paranormal conferences, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to sound intelligent. So I read up on photography and techniques and how the camera works and how light interacts with the either film or the sensor. And the more I learned, the more I realized all of these photos that I was getting myself that I thought were ghosts that I was putting out there to the public, they were mistakes. They were camera mistakes that I made. And was that tough on your psyche to, yeah. to realize you had made mistakes and in fact were teaching people things that were wrong? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it was a big deal. You first you had that idea that I've been doing this wrong for years. And and I always like whenever I have something like that, I really get down on myself because I was like, wow, I, I not only have I been doing it wrong, and I thought I was, you know. I thought I was the shit, <laughs> really. I thought I was like, I know what I'm doing and, and I'm an expert and all of this. And, and I wasn't, I was, I didn't know anything, anything. And the fact that I was going out to people's homes, their private homes, uh, like you see on TV shows, going out there, spending a couple hours in the dark, doing all the stuff that you see on the TV ghost hunting shows. And then at the end of the night, telling them, yes, this scratchy noise that I hear in my audio recorder, that's a ghost. This little ball of light in this photo, that's a ghost. And I was telling these people that their house was haunted. And you could see that they weren't relieved. There was anxiety. There was fear. And then I left. You know, then I left. I was like, well, I'm done my ghost hunt for the night. I spent my four or five hours in your house. Thanks. I'm going to post the pictures later and uh, move on to the next one because I, I thought I was doing science. I thought I was doing proper investigation, but I wasn't, I was thrill seeking. I was really thrill seeking. And that's really tribal knowledge when it comes to ghost hunting, because that's what everybody does. There you go. So let me use the no true Scotsman fallacy on you. You must have never really believed because you don't believe now. Obviously, you were no true believer. How, how could you change your mind so completely? New information. You know, new information comes in. I was like, wow, this is, it, it actually, it, it had two effects on me. The more I learned, the more, I, and the more I realized I, I was wrong. It had that, that immediate kind of um, 
almost like a depression effect because I was so down on myself because I had misled people. I had given wrong information. I contributed to false information being out there. And so that, is this in your consciousness that this is like part of why you enjoy doing what you do now on the other side of it? I think it's not, not necessarily why I enjoy it, but I think that's why I'm as passionate as I am about it because I'm trying to make up for what I did before. Oh, very cool. And, and that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and the second part is that I found a new thrill, if you will, um, more square, square uh, scarecrows, <clears throat> excuse me, where instead of getting that weird ball of light and thinking it's a ghost and getting excite, excited about it, now I'm getting excited about solving the mystery. Mm -hmm. Actually solving, not just saying, well, you know what? Uh, Hilda died in her bed back in 1836 and she's the only one that died in the house. So obviously the ghostly voice that we got on our recorder is her, so, mystery solved. That's not solving a mystery. That's making a guess and just going with it. I like actually finding all the documents, original documents, piecing everything together. And when it all comes together and I can really show you the, the, the chain of custody, you know, of, of how all the events evolved over the years and boom, here you go. I, I, here's the, here's the, the solution. That's amazing to me. It's amazing. I get so excited. I like. I'm, I'm feeling it now. I can't stop smiling. I get so excited about it. Like, so, yeah. so, 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 pick one. Give us a taste of one of your most fascinating or impactful investigations, or maybe one that didn't go the way you thought it would go. What do you think? Ah, wow. Um, impactful. So, I, I can give you. I can, this is a roundabout, um, impactful story, and I'm going to keep it short because I know I, I don't want to take up the whole time with this, but. Uh, the Dybbuk Box. The Dybbuk Box is known as one of the world's most haunted objects. And it's in my, my buddy, Zach Baggins' Not Haunted Museum. Your buddy? Zach yes. Baggins is your buddy, huh? My, my, my buddy. <laughs> he hates me so much. Uh, so For those who don't know who Zach Baggins is, just like a, you know, a one-sentence or two-sentence intro, who's Zach Baggins? He's a famous ghost hunter. That's about it. <laughs> That's on TV. He's been on TV for many years. So he's got a large following um, and a museum in Las Vegas, Nevada. Ah, yes. So that's where the Dybbuk box is currently held. And there's a long story associated with the Dybbuk box. And if you're interested, please go, by all means, look it up. I do have an article about it on skepticalinquirer.org. So check that out. Um, but it's supposed to be a cursed item. So bad things happen to people that either own it or touch it or in the presence of it. And I researched the crap out of it. Uh, it. It was a fascinating story. I not only got in touch with the original person that created the story, Kevin Manis. Um, he's the one that sold it originally on eBay and had this whole backstory uh, about it being cursed and, and everything. I got him to admit that he made up the story. And which was great. I mean, I did all this research about the box itself because it's actually a mini bar from the 1950s. It was mass produced and I have one. I have one downstairs in my basement and I actually have all the original glassware and mine is actually filled with spirits of the vodka and rum Real kind. <laughs> so, so you said you, you got him to, to confess like thumb screws, like what, like what, what? No, no, I, cause I, I researched the background really well, and I even contacted a rabbi, and we were talking because a dibbuk is something from Jewish folklore, and it has a specific story that's associated with it. So I had contacted a rabbi, rabbi who, who gave me all the information in the back, and I was able to track down a lot of uh, other information about it. And out of nowhere, Kevin Manis actually reached out to me and said, hey, you know, like I saw your story, I saw your article, and it's really good. Um, I'd, I'd like to talk if, you know, sometime. And I offered for him to come on my show. And uh, he did. He came on and we talked about it. We had a long conversation. And it was more twist. He, he kind of twisted in a way of he's a storyteller. That's his art. So he doesn't admit openly that it's a hoax, but he did make it up. So, yeah. Yeah, take that how you want. Anyway. Long story short, I'm trying to get to the end here because I don't want to take up your time, but basically I was at a paranormal conference 
and I was set up. I have a skeptical help booth, which is, it looks like Lucy's uh, stand. It actually looks like a little bit like that, except more orange and it says skeptical help bar on top. And some of these paranormal conferences allow me to set up, which is really cool. It's really nice of them to do that. And as I was setting up, I had this big poster that's in a frame and it tracks the history and timeline of the Dybbuk box. And a woman came up and she's like reading it. And then she's like, can you tell me more about this? Like, is this actually fake? Is that what you're saying? And I explained the entire story to her and she started crying. And uh, like, what, what's going on? Like, I don't, what did I say? And she's like, I visited the museum in Las Vegas and she had some special tour before it opened. She went in and she was able to, I think she was able to touch the Dybbuk box that's in there. And she thought because of all the rumors and stories that she was cursed from that because two weeks later, unfortunately, her son committed suicide. Oh, man. So she is associated touching the Dybbuk box, this cursed item, with her son's passing. And telling the story, showing all the evidence, the documentation that I had, because I have everything. Like, I had the original patent. Um, from when the mini bar was in production, showed it to her. When she saw it, she felt relieved. She had this whole belief and she carried this weight of her son's death on her shoulders because of something she thought she did. And if I hadn't been at those conferences, if I, if I don't go to those kind of conferences, because nobody's really skeptical of those. No one really does in-depth investigations. It's, it's a lot of show. It's a lot of storytelling, a lot of story sharing. But she would have never realized that because she's not, she wasn't the type of person to actually go out and look for skeptical literature. So when she had that story, she found it, she felt so relieved. I mean, we, we were hugging for a couple minutes because she was so relieved. And that, that's one of, I never thought one of my stories would go that far. That's amazing. Um, but yeah, it, it was a fascinating story, and, and, the, and I'm so glad I did it. In the skeptical community, we always talk about you know what the harm is in these false beliefs, and, and there is a, yeah, this woman carrying this guilt that she thought yeah she was responsible because she touched touched a freaking wine a cabinet, a, a mini bar, <laughs> uh, you know. Wow. Um, so you recently published an article about tagging along with a ghost hunting team uh, as the lone skeptic. Right. Um, do you do that kind of thing often? How does that go? And like, how do they let you there? Because they must know at this point, Google Kenny Biddle. And like, you're not on their <laughs> site anymore. So, yeah, I mean, I, I do it as often as I can. It, it's not as often as I would like. Um, but do you disguise yourself like as Zach Baggins so they think you're someone else? What happens? Well, I actually did that in the Zach Baggins Museum the first time. <laughs> <laughs> when I went, uh, Susan Gerbic and Mark Edward, I, I went, well, and, and my wife Donna, the four of us went during PsyCon one year, uh, and that was the first time we went. And I, was, I had glasses on that made me kind of look <laughs> like Zach. I had my hair done. Um, and, and just Did anybody come up to you and say, uh, Mr. Bang, is, no, where, where would no. you like this exhibit moved? No, no. <laughs> and I, I, you know what? I learned recently why, because he's very, he's a tiny person. And I'm not oh. trying to be insulting, um, but he is a small person. Short of stature, short, okay. Short and hmm. uh, smaller than I thought. Okay. Um, so yeah, no I'm mistake. Much, no mistake in YouTube body no, types. Then no, not at all. Oh. Um, where was I? Uh, da -da, lost my train of thought. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, you're going along. I'm sorry, I I'm going along with oh <laughs> with another with Side actual track. ghost hunters. Okay, so yeah, I, I, I love going on on those to observe. And that's what I really try to do. Just observe to see what people are doing, how they're doing it. Uh, I've been on a couple uh, like pay to play ghost hunts, where it's like you can pay 20 or $30 to participate in a ghost hunt led by a ghost hunting team. And it's usually a historic place. Um, and the money usually goes to the, to the location. So I usually tag along and just sit in the corner and watch. Uh, other times I ask teams if I can go with them, especially if they say they have this great place or they advertise like on social media, this place was amazing. They got so much evidence and it's, it's, you know, it's amazing off the hook, how much activity is going on there. I, I reach out to them and say, can I go along? 
I would love to go along and see all of this activity, even a little part of it. And let me guess, every time you do that, you find all this paranormal activity. (laughs) Uh, No. (laughs) No? No, no. I try. I really, really try. Uh, I go along with them. I let them do what they're doing. I don't interfere unless they ask me because that's, that's one of my rules, you know, like they're doing their thing. And I want to, I want to see, because when they do ask me, because th- that always happens, they do ask what I thought, then that opens the door to me, us having a conversation saying, well, you did it this way. Might I suggest, you know, next time you do it this way, have some controls on, on your little experiment or, you know, maybe do it this way you, or don't leave a audio recorder in a lo- alone in a room. You Are know, they receptive to this kind of stuff? Most of the time. Yeah. You know, because I think it's the approach, the approach. Uh, I'm not confrontational. I'm not trying to make them look stupid or, or dumb. Or right, you don't say, hey, bozo, you know, that ain't right. going to work that way. Right. I'm always asking them to explain what they're doing, you know, or if they have this concept in their head about how something actually works or if they're convinced that that a place is haunted. I try to I my first question is. Explain to me, tell me why you think this way. Help me understand where you're coming from. And that opens the door because I'm not being confrontational. I'm not saying you're dumb. You know, no, it's not like this. I start a conversation. They're engaged because people like to talk about themselves. They like to talk about what they're into and what interests them and, and what they think they like that. So if you give them the opportunity, it opens the door. It bridges that gap between us. Yeah. And, uh, the, the, the ghost hunt that you're referring to, um, the two people that run it are friends of mine. And we get along great. I mean, we have different viewpoints, but we never fight. It's never a bitter fight. We have discussions. And if we don't agree, we just simply don't agree. That, that's it. We walk away and, you know, we, we go have a beer and then we hang out and then we get together again. Building but, bridges. So, yeah, we're going to talk yes. about your psycon talk in a little bit, which is that's the subject. Cool. So I wanted to talk about, before we get to that, one other topic that I know you're interested in besides the ghost something is psychics and mediums, right? Yes. Um, can you tell us about what sort of investigations that you've done in that regard? Uh, maybe the incident with the missing girl that was fairly recent. Uh, oh, 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 you're going to get me fired up. Um, so... Yeah, there's a few things that I do with, with psychics and, and mediums, um, I, and I do know a bunch too. I, I'm I'm good friends with many of them, and I try to get them to sit with me, but usually they won't. They won't do it. They just flat out refused, and I I'm pretty sure I know why. But you mean um, wait, to sit with you? You mean to do a reading? Do on, a reading? Right? Yes. That's what you mean? Yeah. Yes. Um, they, I think to date there has not been a psychic slash medium that I know that has done a reading for me. Hmm. It's always been someone that doesn't know me. And I sit down and just, you know, pay my $20 or $30 or whatever and say, all right, you know, go ahead and read me. That's not and a thing the- in the industry, is it? Like a, like a ther- therapist would not see someone they know, you know, just because. Uh, yeah, this is anyone. Anyone can sit down. And as long as you have money (laughs) i mean i guess i I mean is there some code of conduct among psychics that they won't read their friends that oh i no 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 because i see them doing it all the time so that's not the reason like psychic fairs or conferences and there there are psychic mediums set up they will read their friends or their friends will post, you know, I had a great reading. I did this. Okay. This is great. I'm, I'm trying I, to give them the benefit of the doubt why they won't read you. But... I, I have no doubt. It's because of, of who I am um, and, and my way of thinking, because I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to uh, fall victim to cold reading techniques, hot reading techniques. I'm going to pull, I'm going to call out right away. Cause I mean, they all know me. <laughs> You know, right. <laughs> so they're all part of my social media feed. Your, all your wife, Deborah, yeah. uh, Donna, Zoe. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if they got that, joke. I would actually be yeah. impressed. Um, okay. But joke. in those cases, when I do sit for, for someone that I don't know, one of the things, this is a small little investigation method that I use. Um, and I can show you because I have one here. I have these little counters and I got these from a educational website. 
um you can get them like there's a catalog that i get uh, every three months it's like all kinds of uh, school supplies that teachers can get and i got a bag of these um, all different colors for like ten dollars but they're counters um and you can i don't know if you can see that let's see yeah. it counts as you push the big button so you push the button and it just adds one so i usually sit down like this and i mean you can't see it it's on my finger and as they ask me questions, if they ask me a question like, has your father passed? Click. And, and uh, maybe I do yes or no questions. That's usually what I do, just mm. yes or no. And if they say, well, you know, they, do they have something here? Every time they ask me a question, I click. And Penny, I see someone who's passed who, <laughs> who had a uniform, maybe Air Force or Army or UPS driver or Navy or mailman. Like, was that six? That was that That's six like questions? six, seven questions. Yeah. 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 Most people would not do that. And they go, oh, they got it right. Because I said yes. That's the last thing they said. Right. 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 So that's how I keep track. And on average, for a 15 minute reading, it averages about 30 questions. Hmm. So almost every 30 seconds, they're asking me something, which they should know. Um, yeah, so that's a little amazing if they know these things then they always get you the information by asking you right questions. yeah i mean i'm i'm doing the reading i should get the 20 dollars. <laughs> you know I, that, that's how i see it uh once in a while i do sit down if they make a sales pitch if i'm walking by their booth and they're like oh come on sit down you know it's only 20 25 dollars and i ask if they have a guarantee like if they get stuff <laughs> wrong do you pay me um and usually that shuts them up yeah but no. So there was another investigation I did. It was actually the brainchild of Ben Radford um, because Ben uh, does Scoring the Strange podcast. And he had this idea, me, him, and Celestia Ward, we took on current missing person cases that had psychics involved. And it was the, the idea was to follow the missing person case in real time until the end um, or you know, when, they, when, I guess when they called it. Uh, so the people who get involved with those, they call psychic detectives. So that's what you're talking about. Yes. Yes. It was, it was to see if any, well, not necessarily psychic detectives, but just psychics that were involved in general. So it could be a psychic detective if that was what the case uh, called for or, or involved, or it could be just somebody that claimed to be a psychic that was making predictions online. So I wouldn't really call those kind of people psychic detectives. They're just throwing shit out there to, like, for their YouTube channel. Isn't that clicks. what they all do? I'm not sure where I would draw that line, but go ahead. <laughs> I get it. I get what you're saying. Uh, so, so anyway, I, I, I looked into a, a local person that was a. Uh, she was a. Uh, she lived in New Jersey. Uh, she had gone missing recently, and it was it was interesting because there were two psychics that were involved with this case. So I'm not going to give you any information about the, the missing person woman because the, their family has gone through enough. Um, but she had visited a psychic, um, Cindy Keza, which is somebody that if you look, if you ever listen to Ono, Ross and Carrie, they have visited her. They've talked about her. She's not good. She's, she's, she's not good. Um, but she had, she had done a show in the area, uh, I think in, somewhere in Jersey. I don't know if it was Atlantic City or somewhere in the area. She was doing a show. And this missing person, uh, a, a young lady, and her family, it was like a, a girl's night out. So her mom, sisters, and a bunch of people, they all went to this psychic show. Now, Cindy claims that she can tell the future and the past and the present about it, people. Um. And the part about that that really pisses me off is that this young lady who was missing, who went missing after the show, little, literally after that show, that night, she was in the audience. I think she got a reading, but nothing came up about you're going to go missing or that she was going to be murdered. Um, because unfortunately, she was murdered that night. And there was nothing from this, this, this psychic. Uh, and then earlier, but you, know, you know, this from retrospect, right? From well, retrospect, at this yes. point, they just knew she was missing. Right. Right. Yeah. They, we only knew that she was missing. Um, I did reach out to, to Cindy uh, asking like, are you in touch with the family? I mean, you're a psychic medium. You, you can tell the future and you can talk to spirits and stuff. Like, 
are you giving information? And I got a very generic reply that I've, I've offered the, the, the family my sympathy or something like that. I don't remember the exact wording. I have it in the article um, that I did. But she didn't offer any information, nothing that a psychic detective or someone that could, you know, see the future or talk to spirits would do. Um, and in retrospect, we already know that the young lady had been murdered. So essentially, she was a spirit. So psychic medium Cindy should have been able to talk to her um, and find out what happened. Uh, and I'm sorry that I'm I'm laughing for anyone that's it, it's it's how I cope with the ultimate stupidity that we're dealing with uh, with this with this kind of case. <clears throat> um, so later on, uh, I, I did take part in the search party, uh, one of the search parties. So well, I, because I, you live in the area, I live close by. It was about an hour and a half drive um, north uh, for me, but I went up there. I met the family. I didn't, I didn't say, you know, I'm here because I'm reporting on something. I was actually going up because in my research, I found out that they were doing a search that weekend. And I was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm involved. I'm, I'm getting to know this young lady through reading her, her, her social media and, and researching her. I want to help. So I went up and, and spent a couple hours up there and I left about 3 p.m. And I think a half hour later, they, they discovered her body. Um, was it anywhere near where you were? No, no, no. It was only about, I would say, like 10, 15 minutes from her house. Mm. It wasn't far at all. Uh, and then later on, I mean, right before, I think, the, the news, the, when the news broke that they found her body, um, I had found another psychic that had a YouTube channel that picked up that case and was giving a bunch of information about where she could be found. And I detail some of that in the article on Skeptical Inquirer. So what's the and name of that article? Do you remember if people want to look that up? Uh, I think it's psychic. Uh, let me look it up real quick mm -hmm. um, because it's. Um, uh, dun, dun. Let me see. Da, da, da. Yeah, and, and after this, I'd like to get to another topic, uh, like what other investigations types of investigations do you do? And, and I, I know you've written some about UFOs. So I'd like to like maybe delve into that just a little bit. You're going to break your, uh, your half hour mark. <laughs> oh, we're done. We're done with that. <laughs> uh, let's see. There we go. Yeah. So the UFO part intrigues me when you do that, because it's, it's, it's not in the same class I'd say. So I, I'd like to, you know, hear what you think about that because you know, psychics, mediums, ghosts, those are clearly paranormal, right? Uh, if those exist, it's, it's something that's outside normal. Um, I don't think if extraterrestrials exist, it's paranormal. It's just that, well, that's cool. Like, you know, other civilizations are visiting us. So the, the, uh, to me, there's a distinct difference there. You don't have to believe in spooky stuff to believe there are aliens. Right. Right. So I'm wondering kind of like what got you interested in that and like what kind of things in that vein have you investigated? Okay. Let's see. Ah, oh, there it is. <clears throat> so the title of the article is Investigating Psychic Predictions in a Missing Person Case. Okay. So pretty simple. It's a uh, real important one because it was something that was ongoing for an actual yeah. dead person. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting. Okay. It was a real interesting case. Yeah, it was great. You got involved with that too, to the, to the extent of actually going to help with the, with the uh, search. That was, I mean, honestly, I, I worked as an EMT for several years. So I, I was in the medical field. I, I've seen dead bodies, but I was actually worried. Like I've never been on a, a search party. What happens if I walk up mm. on her and, and like, that's I have serious, to be the man. one that says I found her, yeah. you know, and, and that was, that was scary to me. That was scary. Um, I wanted to, because I wanted the family to have some closure, but well, it's, it's, it's good. It happened so soon yeah. after you were involved. Right. You have to right. think about that for a long period of time. Okay. So a little more lighthearted, the UFO stuff. Yeah. So what, what, what gets you interested in that? Cause it's not paranormal, so to speak. I, I group it all together. 
like UFOs and monsters, Bigfoot and ghosts. And yeah, Bigfoot wouldn't be paranormal either. It would be just a giant ape, which somehow we know, just never, I, you know, seeing. Yeah, I think it's just that group of strangeness or, or just oddities that I, I, I love. But UFOs, I mean, that just fascinates me because when you, when you think, especially now, I mean, holy crap. But even growing up, looking up into the sky and seeing all those stars and, and just the vastness of space. It's like, there's gotta be life out there. <laughs> there's gotta be, you know, and I, and I growing up on star Wars, growing up on star Trek uh, and then all the other sci-fi movies and, and TV series that, that we grew up on. And then also in search of stuff like that, that you just, it was just fascinating. So UFOs just get, get I mean, I think I think the quote unquote evidence that's out is horrible. It's it's horrible. It's not evidence. It's just it's crap. But it still fascinates me. And just like any other weird thing. I mean, I, I also do religious miracles if if I can. So I mean, but the UFOs, I mean, I'm secondary. I gotta give props to Mick West. I mean, he's oh, he's yeah. the man. He's the man when it comes to it. I go to him when I have a question, but I still like to dabble, you know, you know, dabble in the cases that, you know, he maybe he pushes aside to get the bigger ones. Yeah, I read one of your articles about it was a you know, spoiler it was a Batman balloon. Yes, <laughs> that was, you know, that was that was fun. That was fun because there was so little information. And that's the problem with all of these leaked photos or videos. There's so little information with it you get just a photo where you get a, a, a few seconds of a video and you got to figure out what it is and it's just because photos i mean photos are my my thing that's that's really what i i excel at so whether it's ghosts or monsters or weird stuff weird stuff i mean i get set pictures from all over the world which is great i mean i i love that i not only do i get to interact with people all over this planet but i get to look at all their strange and freaky photos <laughs> it's an interesting connection the photographic connection because you're a photographer um because with a psychic psychic medium you did some investigation of a new zealand psychic as i recall having to do with ghost orbs or something like that yes yeah that was uh via susan gerbeck she was investigating that psychic that i think she ran for some kind of government office or something too yeah um, well, she was running for one of one of the um minister positions in in, uh, in that country yeah right so yeah she had some photos that during one of her talks her lectures she put these photos up as proof positive of the spirits that she was seeing and i was like well that's dust <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> that's that's a double exposure um that's a long exposure i mean they were very common camera mistakes uh, photography mistakes and for someone that I usually differentiate between a picture taker and a photographer. So a photographer usually knows what they're doing. They know how their camera works, all the options, and then beyond. You know, that's where it starts. But a picture taker is literally someone that holds a camera up and goes, click, click. That's oh, that's it. me. I'm a picture taker. Then, <laughs> by that definition. So a picture taker is not going to understand all these weird things that they get when they take like a, a photo. Also, frankly, them. if they believe in weird stuff and they get a picture yeah. of a weird thing, they want to believe it's a weird thing, right? They, they don't ask the question, ooh, is this explainable? Yeah. And especially in the case of, of uh, uh, Jeanette Wilson, that's what, that, that was her name. Um, I mean, she has a, a, a financial interest in promoting these kind of things. So, I mean, because she, she was making a lot of money. <laughs> oh, she's the one. I, don't know, I hope I don't. She said her name. I hope I don't get this wrong. But I think she was a, like medical healer or something. Was she the one channeling? Channeling some, yeah. There, doctors, there was that, dead doctors who were then yeah. going to tell her how to heal people. Oh my God. I think she was her mentor. Was the the person that would channel a spiritual doctor, <sighs> and that mentor was actually. I think he was accused by multiple women of of sexual misconduct and he's in prison i think now because he, he was in big trouble but yeah there's a lot there's a that's a great story too <laughs> and that's wow. detailed in the article so go check that one out check too. the article out all right so let's talk about psycon okay um 
you've run workshops of previous icons, uh, but yes. this year will be your first appearance, I think, as a featured speaker on the main stage, correct? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so will you be getting a coveted Psycon wine bottle engraved with your name for the first time, or did they hand those out to workshop? Uh, people you around workshop? You yeah. guys, you have them from the workshops. You, these two, look at them. That's amazing. <laughs> so they don't give those to uh, Sunday paper presenters. So I have missed out twice, Kenny. Oh. I am beyond jealous. Um, oh. I submitted a proposal to do another talk this year, by the way. So if they take it, it will be a hat trick. Ooh. So maybe if that happens, the conference powers of B will make a special exception. Uh, <laughs> I can dream. Uh, but anyway, I digress. Um, your PsyCon talk is called Bridging the Gap Between Some Paranormal Believers and Skeptics. And it's described as follows on the site. When it comes to fringe topics such as ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, and the like, there's usually two sides, believers and skeptics. Both sides usually clash when mixed together, while also finding comfort in preaching to their like-minded circles. Rather than avoiding confrontation, I, that's Kenny, not only attend paranormal-themed events, participate wherever possible. I'll talk about why building bridges is better than burning them, metaphorically. So yeah, can you tease anything else about that talk? That sounds uh, really phenomenal. I mean, we're we're I'm I'm still working on it because it's never been something I put in one kind of a talk, especially one that can only be like 25 minutes long, um, because I do oh, have a habit of talking a lot. Don't don't, don't complain. The Sunday papers gets 10. Oh well, see, I couldn't do that either. <laughs> I mean, I the workshops I was doing, I had an hour or two. Yeah, that's amazing. I was like, yeah. That's great, and I still yeah. went over. Um, well, last time I blame uh, Jim Underdown. Yeah, because you did it as a joint thing. I was <laughs> yeah, we did one. a joint. Yeah, but this one is more. I, I don't. I'm hoping everyone enjoys it because it's it's going to be talking more about getting together and talking and discussing and why the, I think that's important. And not only just talking, but experiencing the other side. Uh, you know, like I, I mentioned that I go to paranormal conferences. I set up at paranormal conferences. They have ghost. I, I go to these big auditoriums with ghost hunters and psychics and mediums and some UFO people, some Bigfoot people. There's mystic metaphysical jewelry stuff. There's Reiki stuff going on. And then here's me with this orange you know peanuts stand that says skeptical help bar real big and i have lights on it too <laughs> so it stands out I, I am definitely a a little goldfish in a piranha pond <laughs> that's that's what i usually see it but i think it's important because they're seeing that i'm i'm participating i'm there i want to hear what they have to say i go to their their uh, their talks i participate on their panel discussions i'm on I, I i sit on the panel and i give the skeptical viewpoint so they get to hear me and i think it's a real good outreach because they see that i'm not i'm not and we talked about this a little earlier where i'm not being confrontational i'm not pointing fingers and saying you guys are crazy i'm listening to them i'm thinking about what they're saying and then we're having a discussion about it. And I think that's that's really good because they're going to come to me later and ask me questions. They're going to come to my booth and they're going to say, hey, you mentioned this. Can Do you mind if we talk about this a little more? And I mean, some of the best compliments I get, and these are definitely, these are testimonials and anecdotes to so take them as you want. But I do have people that are diehard believers come up to me afterwards and say, thank you. I never thought about like that experience that way. And now I have something to go forward with. You know, each time I do my investigation now, I'm going to be thinking about this. Like if I talk about audio clips, you know, how so much, uh, uh, so many uh, things can cause weird things on your audio equipment or when your broken radio is spitting out like all these weird messages that you think are from ghosts. And I explain the mechanics behind it and what really is going on. Now they start thinking about it and applying it. And what's best is when someone actually is standing at my booth, another person walks up and asks a question. And instead of me explaining it, that other person that I just talked to that is now convinced starts a discussion and gives a skeptical viewpoint. 
Wow. Yeah, I, that's it so blows cool. my mind. You know, and, and I, I just love it. And that's why I keep doing it. Now, is, it is there something about your history of personality which makes you especially suited to doing that as opposed to perhaps other skeptics like me would just go in and like argue and scream at people? Is it, is it because you were on the other side? You're, and that's, I, I, well, I think, I think you answered your own question partly because if you go in and argue, <laughs> you, they're not going to like you. They're probably they're not my like car in the parking lot. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they would, they would flatten your tires and everything, but no, it's, you know what? I mean, I was, I was a ghost hunter. So I spent several years doing exactly what you see on TV and what I see at the conferences. I, I, I've done that. So I have the experience. I can relate. And instead of being content with that, I kept looking for more. So I think I've grown and I don't want to sound conceited or anything, but I've learned a lot more. I've, I've grown, I've evolved and I can take that information back to, to people that are content and say, well, let's, let's talk about it. You, you know, and if they're open with like the, an expression, something like never stop learning or something. Never like stop learning. I mean, that, that's what I live by. That's, that's, I have it on buttons. I have it on, on notebooks. I thought stuff. I saw that somewhere. I mean, I have it. Yeah. My, my stickers that come up, it's on the top. So never stop learning. And, and when you think about that, that's the point, you know, like let's, why are we investigating this to learn what's going on? Why are we investigating this haunted house? Why are we investigating this alleged UFO sighting to learn what's going on? True. If you're just content with your, your preconceived belief, you're not learning. You're not progressing. You're not doing anything. So yeah. Yeah. I'd rather have a conversation and talk. Um, and that's, that's what this, this talk is going to be about. Just right. <laughs> some right. of what we just talked about and, and a little bit more, maybe right. some experiences or maybe I'll throw some, photos and video up on the screen so people can see me interacting uh fantastic so wrap up questions about the conference why should people make an effort to go to any skeptical conference and particularly this one to learn to see what the other i mean i try to encourage people that are i guess you would call them believers so get them to go to a science conference just like i go to paranormal conferences and i go to all of them, ufos bigfoot i go to all of them but I encourage everyone to go to a science conference to see what people are talking about. There's, there's this, this, uh, the common, um, excuse I'm going to, I'm going to say this common excuse for people to say, well, scientists don't want to do this or scientists don't like this. They're not interested in it or they just shun us. Well, that's all hearsay. That's your made up bullshit. Go to a science conference and actually ask the scientists. And I'm sure many of them are going to be interested in that topic. And they're going to be able to give you some information. I mean, some of them, yes. Some might shun you. Some might say, no, I don't have time for that. But I think the majority, at least in my experience, will talk to you and give you some information. It's going to be worth it. You're going to see that they're not evil. They're not all Dr. Evil. <laughs> they're good people. And they're friendly. And they're approachable. And, and that's I mean, the, oh, you learn so much. And for, people, insights, Kenny. The, for people that aren't believers that are into the sciences, you're going to get to listen to people that are in their fields. They're talking about their life's work. You know, some of the stuff that we learned at, at the conferences. I mean, we, I, I, was, I was fascinated by, and I forget who it was. Somebody gave a talk about certain fishes that change sex yes. spontaneously. Yeah. And I was like, what? I didn't know that. That's fascinating. And I was hooked. I mean, there are so many good topics. And how there. about, did you, were you at Susan Blackmore's when she, she talked yes. about her history? So Susan Blackmore, a uh, psychologist, she started as a parapsychologist trying to explain her that she had, she had a, a out-of-body experience uh, yeah. a, a, as a young person. And she decided she's going to go into the sciences to prove this. And she comes out going, no, we could explain it with science. It wasn't what, we, what I thought it was. Right. She, it was like a lunchtime kind of a talk yeah. i think yeah. yeah yeah i was i was sitting right in the front row that was fun. Loved that it. was really interesting loved it i mean it's it's a real good place to learn and to mingle i mean i i got to and i mean you did too you got even more but i got to mingle with bill nye i mean which was fascinating to me I mean, you got to interview him 
But um, yeah, no, whatever. I didn't interview, but I talked to him first. You talked to him. You had a record. You had your phone up. I yeah, saw yeah, yeah, yeah. I got like that 10 was minutes. an interview. I asked him about Mars because you know I'm an aerospace engineer. We're both mechanical engineers. We talked about that kind of stuff. Yeah, but still, I mean that that's that's wonderful. You can talk to all these people. I mean, I we we hung out. That's the first time we met, right, at SciCon. Well, the first time. The first time we met, uh, I, I won this bottle from you. Oh, my goodness. You still got it. That's awesome. Well, it's empty. I did open it. Okay. <laughs> but I'm keeping the bottle as a souvenir. Oh, that's so cool. So, yeah, that's yeah. So Susan cool. Gerbeck, who I've also interviewed, and you'll see that probably running before this interview. because uh, She's a speaker this year, too. Mm -hmm. uh, she wrote an article that interviewed you about your first workshop and said something like, the first person who mentions this article to Kenny... He's going to buy a drink for, you know, <laughs> she added that. <laughs> like, I didn't know that was coming. She that's what you say. Herself. She doesn't agree with that. Oh, that's bullshit. Like she just, she said it. I'm like, wait, what, <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> oh, okay. So, so yes, Kenny bought me a drink. Yes. And, and I actually saved it for a special occasion. So yes. awesome. Awesome. I mean, yeah, you get to hang out with people that just are, you, you have such great conversations. I love, everyone that I meet there. And, and it's just, I, mean, I have not had a bad experience. And SciCon has just been great to me. You know, they've given me a platform where I can, I can talk and uh, bring all this information that I have and show people like the workshops that I've done for them. I love doing them because I get like, this is going to be different this year. Being up on stage is weird for me. And I'm going it, to, it's going to be an adjustment because I'm used to interacting with everyone. Yeah. Getting in, in there, in the rows and saying, do this, do that. So not to make you too nervous, but the both times I did it, they did, okay, Rob, I'm free to go. And like the mic wasn't working. And then, then, and the next time I had a video in my PowerPoint presentation and the audio didn't play. It's like, oh, you know, <laughs> not to I, make you nervous. I'm used to it though. I mean, I'm not so nervous. I do two live shows a week and I'm used to being on camera. I'm used to talking. I'm used to things messing up. Sure. It just happens, you know? And so if it happens, oh, well, you know, well, we'll I'll just talk louder if the mic doesn't work, <laughs> you know? The thing I mean, I, I, that I really like about the, the uh, structure of it, I, I've been to other uh, conferences that weren't skeptical in nature, but some like, you know, Comic-Con things. And like, they have things in parallel. You have to pick between like five things running yeah. simultaneously and you're always missing out on something. Psycon, except for the workshops, the, the, the first day, they don't do that, right? right? Everything is sequential and you can see every speaker if you, if you want to spend the time. I've been to the Science and Engineering Festival in DC. And, and that was, as you explained, yeah. there were like five different uh, yeah. talks going on at the same time all spread you out. You always feel like you miss something. Yeah. That, you know, you have yeah. to make a choice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And this, yeah, like you said, everything's, you can come in to the, the main room and sit down, get your notebook out like me and uh, sit there just the whole time. Be like, all right, good. Yeah. Next speaker. Yeah. All right. I'm getting everything. And I love it. I so love there's a reason people. people to come to this one. Okay. So Candy, thanks for your time today. Uh, it was welcome. great to be able to record this talk. So I could share it with my Skeptical Inquirer column readers. Awesome. And anyone else who stumbles across it on the interwebs once it's posted. Cool. Thank you.